right. Hello and welcome back, everyone. We are here for the 13th and final discussion of Hayden, White, Hayden White's Tropics of Discourse, Essays in Cultural Criticism. And uh, we have made it, actually. We, uh, I, believe it or not, I, it's for me difficult to believe that we made it this far. We finished this project. So that before like June, we, right? Yeah. Was it, didn't we like start in June or something like that? I, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I was in a different. I was in a different part of the world. I was in Hong Kong. You were. Kong. Oh my yeah. gosh! This the, the the book club has like followed your life journey and everything. <laughs> wow. Uh, before we get into this essay, John, would you like to show our next book, uh, Benjamin Fondane? Yeah. So um, so as Duffo just said, we're going to be wrapping up the discussion of Hayden White uh, that. Daniel and Davud have read so patiently with me. I, I, I'm the one who suggested this. And I don't think, uh, I don't know, uh, Daniel, if you had know, known of David White, and I think he was new to Davud. They both just said, okay, and went along with the ride okay. for six months. Mm -hmm. so I'm incredibly, incredibly grateful for them being so, um, so kind as to do that. Um, this next one, our next uh, read, and we will have another one. Uh, we plan to start sometime in January is a, a book from the New York Review of Books Press. And it was one I just sort of stumbled across in their philosophy section. Um, they do uh, sort of a, an interesting job curating some, some work that has uh, never become quite popular or fallen out of popularity. And uh, I found this, it's called um, Existential Monday by Benjamin Fondan. And he was apparently um, a Romanian-born French philosopher who um, was killed in the concentration camps during World War II, but wrote this either um, during the war or shortly before. And it's uh, not going to take as much of our time. It is uh, not including the introduction. It's something around 80 pages. So we'll probably make a couple of discussions out of it and move on to something else. But this is what we're reading next. So if you want to read along with us or um, anything like that, that should give you a solid month or so to get the text and be able to uh, read with us. Mm -hmm. That's great. All right, back to Hayden White. The title of this last essay is The Absurdist Moment in Contemporary Literary Theory. And uh, it was published originally in 1976 and a few years later in this collection, maybe a couple of years later. And uh, the topic, as the title suggests, is literary theory and how it, according to Hayden White, as a way it progresses, it, it, its own unfolding, according to its own internal logic, gets to a moment or develops into a stage uh, of absurdity, for lack of a better term. And uh, that means that the fundamental distinctions that uh, literary theory is driven by, that literary theory begins by recognizing, like the distinction between literature and criticism, or literature and life, literature and experience, and the function of literature in relation to life, and the function of criticism in relation to uh, literature. So those fundamental distinctions, fundamental categories, they, they begin to shake, and the boundary between them begins to get blurry. That is where uh, what uh, White refers to as the normal critics, uh, they get attacked by or they get criticized by the absurdist critics. I'll read one passage uh, from the second uh, page of the essay. It is from the second paragraph. Um, this is the point where one of the functions of, Eden White is talking about, one of the primary functions of absurdist uh, critics, absurdist literary critics, is to um, make points that are not just about literature, but also, also about criticism itself. So they reflect on their own tasks. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, because they take it so seriously and they apply it to themselves, uh, they begin to destabilize the whole discipline. So uh, we read here, quote, uh, when the absurdist critic Foucault, Barth, uh, Derrida comment on a literary artifact, it is always in the interest of making a metacritical point but it is difficult for the normal critic to ignore the absurdist critic, for the latter always shows himself to take the critical enterprise more seriously than the former. He is willing to bring the critical enterprise itself on their question." End quote. So it is, uh, again, the directing of that function, the enterprise of criticism, and applying it to uh, criticism itself. 
and begins the process of destabilization. Now we can discuss several points here, but whether this is an inev inevitability, as White seems to suggest, uh, that inevitably the absurdist moment will arrive um, because of the, if we take theory seriously and uh, other related points. Please, Daniel. We'll go next. No. Okay, John. Um, so he, he starts out and, and talks about how uh, we have something like normative criticism up through roughly World War II. Um, I would, and again, he's talking about normative criticism kind of in the way that um, we used to think about the social sciences in a naive way uh, about how we can use language as this uh, crystalline transparent tool to uh, communicate ideas about a text, its history, its, its meaning, its, um, its interpretation in a very unproblematic way. So, um, you know, this, this, this idea based, this assumption basically underlies pretty much all of 19th century literary criticism, Ruskin, and everything before it. And then some, somehow um, having two world wars in the span of a generation um, uh, causes this, this sort of rupture with previous assumptions. And it's not an, it's not an automatic thing. It, it happens over a few decades. And I would place it a little bit later than White does. I would say it's more like the 60s than World War II. 60s is really when Derrida pops, on the, pops into everything. But um, where, um, where, where, where the assumption behind uh, normal criticism which is that you can sort of break experience up into these nice neat little categories. This is the text and this is my life and this is the language I use to describe it and this is the world outside of the text. These, these lines start to get blurred, like, like Davout said. But um, we, we, use, we use language, um, but it's, it's, it's a sense of how deeply you wanna question that language. Um, normal criticism makes the, the strong assumption that language is, is, does its job in a reliable way. And, uh, and I think uh, and, and we can talk about this as we get more into it, but absurdist, what he'll end up calling absurdist criticism um, does, does an interesting thing in questioning the role of language, but it's kind of like the Ouroboros, you know, the, the monster that eats its own tail. Uh, it's, it's sort of in doing it, it goes to, it can go too far. And it's just, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit absurd. I mean, um, and you end up, um, he has that, that saying at the very beginning of the essay where um, we start to worship silence. <laughs> um, and when literary criticism is all about silence, he says something like that's the sign of a culture that has become totally unmoored from itself. Um, and I, I kind of agree with that. No, that, that's wonderful. And, uh, and yeah, gentlemen, six months, my goodness. Uh, I've enjoyed this immensely and look forward to what's to come. I'm so glad we could come together. Um, it, you know, it's kind of like with criticism when you're um, criticizing literature and suggesting that literature is not possible. Doesn't that kind of make the criticism you just did vanish? Doesn't it just kind of take its whole self with it? Like, so I like the image you have there of the snake eating its own tail. And it's kind of like, in some respects, kind of how I envision uh, kind of what's happened. It's, it's almost like for a very long time, we were wearing a pair of glasses and then World War II or the 60s came along and someone's like, wait a minute, you're wearing glasses. You're like, don't you see? And it's like, there was actually a construct here that you were operating according to. And you're like, oh my gosh. But then the problem is maybe the absurdist critic is like, and then they just leave the glasses off. They're like, see, they're not real eyes. So we need to stop using them. It's like, but I, but I literally can't see. I have to do some form of reading, some sort of analysis in order to give the world meaning. No, nah, man, it's just a pair of glasses. It's not real eyes. And so you have this sort of weird um, self-devouring that can occur if you if you don't go that far. Now, you know, some of the thinkers, I should also know, I, I agree, um, we were talking about before uh, we, we started recording on this idea that very often, Mr. White is accused of being someone like a Derrida, a Foucault or a Barth, or this deconstructional class of, of critics. And I think this essay does a good job of showing that he's trying, he's, there's some distance, there's 
some separation between his project and some of these different mo modes. Now, some of the scholars of, say, Foucault and Derrida and, and Barthes may say that this is um, this sort of idea that they're saying that there's no, there's no, you can't read anything because it doesn't make any sense, or it's all deconstructional. That that might be a stereotype that they might be saying things different than that. But I, but I do think it's it's quite clear that there are a lot of people inspired by those thinkers of whom have gone in an absurdist direction. That gets us into the question of to what, um, you know, I don't think Derrida, from what I recall of on grammatology, is saying that any interpretation goes. Um, for example, I think he wants to say that a lot more interpretations go than we think, but not any interpretation. It's much wider. Someone like Barthes in saying that the author is dead, he's not saying that the um, accomplishments of the author are not so great. They want to say that authors are almost um, a point that's collecting all of these different streams together. So you can't isolate the meaning of a text simply by determining what the author thinks. That doesn't mean that the text has no meaning at all. It just means that the text is really difficult to determine. Meaning. That's how I think some of those writers are. Doesn't change the fact that they have inspired, maybe through a Harold Bloom misreading or whatever, a type of criticism that I think um, indeed falls into the absurdism that Mr. White is talking talking about. So I think anyone who um, might be listening to this that take ish that takes issue with the association that he has with these thinkers with that um, way of interpretation uh, should keep in mind that even if it's the case that the original thinkers maybe were more nuanced, that they still manage, I think, to inspire followers that fall into the pitfalls that Mr. That Mr. White is um, discussing. But it, but it's quite interesting. We've gone through, you know, reading Mr. White, where he's really raised the stakes of literature being so important, thinking literary, having a literary mindset to go into history, history being a, a genre of literature. And then you turn around and you're like, oh, but we're not really good at literary criticism right now. Mm. So I just kind of suggested that in order to understand history, we need to be able to think literarily. And the state of literary criticism may not be so good. Oh, Dawn, uh, that, that needs to be corrected in order to accomplish, to really kind of, um, and then I'll pass it on to Davoud, to really bring about um, sort of the change that he wants to bring, that he seems to want to, uh, to engender, uh, that, that is not assisted if you have literary criticism that is devouring its own tail. Great, great. I'd like to take it back to what uh, John said. John um, mentioned the, the phrase, uh, Normative criticism, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, normative criticism, which implies that you can clarify what you mean. It was actually I, I wanted. To ask I, I, I meant to say normal, but normative is is just as true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it implies normative criticism implies that uh, the categories of good and bad in uh, works of in literary works, literary artifacts. This is a good piece of literature. Is a, has more merit, more value. It is a better reflection of maybe human nature or the culture of a time and uh, correspondingly worse or bad works of or fa failing works, uh, works of literature. Um, so that takes for granted, that's normal or normative approach to criticism, takes for granted those things and they, that evaluation, the process of judgment, process of categorizing or putting on a scale, it implies uh, that there's a, there are a set of tasks, maybe not one task, but there are a set of tasks that a work of literature can, or literary work can uh, fulfill the standards that literary artifacts can live up to or fail to live up to. And uh, crit critics can keep working with these st standards of evaluation for a while, but they can get, also get interrupted after some time uh, with other approaches like uh, what White refers to as the reductive or reductionist uh, approaches to criticism. Somebody might come and uh, offer a Marxist critique or a feminist critique or a colonial uh, critique say, you know, all these things that you're talking about, you're forgetting, you're neglecting the political dimension, the political network or matrix within which these uh, works of literature are being written. Maybe the, uh, the structures or imbalances of power, the political uh, forms of oppression, these works are fitting into it and maybe perpetuating it. So, so these uh, normal critics get into it, they feel like, oh, this is like our work is now, it's not as stable anymore. So enough times, if these, if these kinds of interruptions happen enough times, um, more and more it becomes uh, unclear. And these uh, criticism continues to develop its own genres. And it's like, okay, this genre of criticism, fem uh, feminist criticism is so different from, uh, let's say, um, a formalist uh, criticism and uh, how, how do we evaluate, how do we choose which one of these uh, we apply? Um, so this is, uh, I'm trying to uh, kind of capture the 
process of destabilization and proliferation of forms in within uh, criticism, within um, works of criti uh, critique. So, Would uh, you mean to ask how, how the destabilization comes about or why there are simply so many forms of what he's calling absurdism? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How is that, how does that come out of the practice of normative criticism? And uh, Okay, so I, uh, my answer to that would, would, I thought he made a very interesting, I'm not sure this is going to quite answer your question. He made, a, he made an interesting comment near the, near the beginning of the essay about how once something tends to, how once something's value is suddenly called into question, like literary criticism, it tends to become fetishized. Um, so he even talks about money. The, the fact that when we see money, um, just ideologically now, we see something that has value, but really money is just a nearly valueless piece of paper with some ink on it. But our ideology in living in a, in a, in a society that uses money um, to purchase things, sometimes very expensive things, um, shows us intuitively that money is more than that, even though it's not really more than that. And so that's sort of like, I think he's what, what he's getting at with fetishization. And there's, I think that whole fetishizing process is what allows you to, to go in so many different directions. There's, he, he hints that um, a couple of the quotes that he takes from uh, one, of the, one of the theorists that he talks about, talks about reading being a, a divine sort of hieratic experience, like this worshipful experience, mm -hmm. um, which just sort of confuses him, I think. And it's like, why is this not a very worldly thing? I mean, it's a text you can hold in your hands and, um, but it, I mean, if, if you're familiar with criticism from the last 50 or 60 years, it's, it's sort of a very common theme to, to, to read stuff like that. And, you know, people like Paul DeMond and Derrida and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But does that answer your question at all? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That, by the way, that uh, essay that he quoted extensively, uh, it was an essay by Poulet. That's the surname of the writer. And the title was Phenomenology of Reading. I actually, I happened to, it's one of those things that I, read the uh, oh really I read the essay during my undergraduate I don't I, it was I don't remember the context but um yeah I came across it it's a very a mysterious very interesting uh, essay it's, it's worth reading and uh it uh, all I did was recognize the name I've never read um, anything by him it, it highlights the it highlights the, this fact that sometimes we read something and this work of art itself is so foreign to us. Yeah, separate it, from it, us. Yeah, it, yeah, it is working. We, we feel it working, but we don't feel necessarily a connection to it. Mm -hmm. so we don't recognize ourselves in it. Um, yeah, what did you think, Daniel, about any of this? Like, <laughs> no, that's excellent. well, you, you know, when you were speaking, I think you know what John was saying about the fetishization. I do, I just do think White is suggesting that where everyone wants to come in and get their part. For example, this thing is very valuable, so everyone's going to take their part of it and make it their own, and it's you know, and 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 so forth and so on. And and then it was interesting because if I if I recall, then it's almost like there could be a response to the fed of that reductionism that's then an inflation, like like a, like a reaction against where then we're going to say no, literature is too holy and great to be so fetishized. But that's of course problematic because then then if I recall, he talks about it almost like you make it a Platonic thing, which then it has nothing to do with cultural currents, and that's a bad reaction. So you start with the normative. Then some, and I think elementary, was that what he talked about that as well? Those kind of went together. So you had the elementary, then there's some sort of event or something happens where it's then ruptured and then there's a reductionism. And then in response to that, there's then an inflation, which is a reaction against the reductionism. And I'm, I understand Mr. White is suggesting that the inflation is not exactly the correct response, um, that he wants to get back to something that doesn't just reduce it to these different streams and say it's nothing more than that, but he also doesn't want to treat it as Platonic. Um, I to to go back to your question a little bit. I, I think he also. I found it very interesting. And I think it was toward the end where he suggests that perhaps the entire 
um, movement of assert, um, absurdism, uh, absurd criticism. I got stuck in my tongue for some reason. Perhaps that was um, part of Western thought with the division between the actual and the appearance, you know, that you get in like Plato or different things. Once you start saying that, oh, there's a real meaning of the text and everything else is a false meaning. Well, right, that right there is a problematic idea that needed to be deconstructed, but arguably in having that be deconstructed, you can go too far then, right? Where then there, um, I, I once... Uh, I heard it because bringing up Barth, um, I heard, it, I think it was, what class was it in? We were reading the Ramayana with maybe Professor Nimick or something that was Hindu, um, Middle Eastern literature. And one of the students asked, they said something like, um, what is, but, what, but what did the writer mean? And uh, Professor Nimick said, uh, you, I'm sorry, you don't get off that easy. And I always thought that was really interesting because what Professor Nemec was trying to get at was that you want to make this act of reading easier by figuring out what the author intended, but actually you don't get off so easy. You have to read harder, not because what the author, not because what the author thought doesn't matter or isn't there or isn't relevant, but there can be this practice of avoiding the difficulty of reading by simply um, trying to determine what the what the author um, said. And if it's the case, if Barth or whoever is um, correct that we can't do that anymore, there's not this platonic form of the author's intention that we can access. Um, there's two responses to that. There can be the, well, what's the point of reading then and give it up entirely. Um, or there could be the response of trying to reclaim a platonic form with the inflated reading that's not really going in the, the right direction, which I think the right direction is what right, um, is upping the ante on reading. Like reading becomes a much fuller and deeper act where you have to work harder in reading and figuring out the art of interpretation and, and hermeneutics um, because, because we can't simply absolve ourselves that difficulty by figuring out what the author intended. So that's kind of what I think White is pointing to that I took it. And, and I do think what, what John was suggesting at the beginning, and then I'll pass it back off, you know, we'll, I, I do agree that it seems like the absurd criticism begins more in the 60s, but, but um, World War II, you know, the, the upsetting of the, the progressive narrative with World War I, all of these, de de it does make it seem like the normal is no longer going to cut it, or the normal assumptions of history are no longer going to cut it. And that might be part two of that destabilization of the given that history is going to go in a progressive dis direction. Like I've been, I've been reading and then uh, this uh, biography on Keynes and all his involvement in the Bloomsburg group. And it's just so fascinating how genuinely they believed right before World War I, as World War I is developing, because you have Bloomsburg before World War I and then between World War I and World War II, how they really just believed that this, that history was going to go a certain direction and then it wasn't in the cognitive dissonance that that developed and how that affected the formation of their literature and their thinking. So I think that too, is part of how you you get into the the, the um, moving in the direction of the reductionist um, mm -hmm. criticism. I think it all kind of plays together, as well as the and and perhaps the fetishization that we're describing is to a natural reaction against feeling like everything's falling apart because you're trying to grab your fra fragment of what's falling apart while you can and lifting it up as having supreme value, so you can give yourself some sort of stability again once um, the normal the normal has been so de destabilized. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and related to that, I, I'm glad that you also mentioned this uh, infl inflationary. Is that the the, the term? Inflative, inflationary, in, something like that. Inflative, uh, yeah, uh, inflationary, which is also a reaction to uh, looking at literature as hyper contextualized, as you know, after the death of the uh, the so called death of the author, yeah. and just things reflecting uh, socio political cultural uh, movements. The uh, works of literature don't. They, they start to lose their status as works of literature. So we have this uh, inflationary, so-called inflationary response that wants to, again, elevate and decontextualize and isolate uh, literary works, artistic works, and say, no, let's just consider them in their own terms. Let's just confront works of art, works of literature, and try try to find their own, their, their, within them, not from outside, not, not by connecting the work to its context, but within it, in its own terms, um, it's based on its own internal structure, trying to evaluate it and then realizing that some works are better, some works are uh, masterful, they, they, they reflect excellence in, in, in skill. Um, and that, that was one, it, it, one aspect of the in, inflation, uh, inflationary uh, approach, or what White calls it, that. Uh, the other one is, uh, is that as a consequence of this um, 
flooding of information because there's so much information uh, works of art and works of literature now need to make themselves really special and almost mystical and that's another reason why the uh, some critics inflate them and trying to make them or claim about them that they are larger than life uh, but that again is something that they, if you pause on it if you just accept it after a while it becomes it, it leads to absurdism because it just cannot be maintained. That level of um, that kind of value, nothing can sustain it. <laughs> because, you know, as you said, you, you said that, that one response to Hayden White is to up the ante on reading. Uh, but another maybe flip, flip side of that would be to say that reading, we can think of it as just one human activity among all the other human activities. That is not as special as we might initially think that, you know, Farming is also another human activity, you know, um, conversation, uh, parenting, all these things are, you know, they're all special and reading uh, and writing. These are just one among all the others and they're all special. Um. <laughs> uh, well, Moore's law says that, you know, about every two years, 16 months to four, 24 months that we double um, our ability, uh, uh, our, our, our ability to compute computing power. And I was just thinking about how interesting it was um, that all of this, this by, I guess what he's talking about is uh, the absurdist sort of strain of things just starts to happen around the rise of the internet. Not, not everyone's ability to access it, but the theoretical beginnings of it in the late sixties and early seventies. Um, and mm -hmm. then, you know, uh, 20 years later, um, it becomes popular and it seems like um, 200, 300 years ago, it would have been possible for one person to know everything. And now it's not just even remotely conceivable. Hmm. So um, hmm. I wanted to talk about um, careerism as through, through the spectrum of the essay. <laughs> um, it, 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 it's interesting how uh, the fetishizing takes place and how it's how how texts or a uh, criticism suddenly uh, uh, increases its stakes becomes more important more alluring because it is um, fetishized um, and I, I wonder to what degree um, that might just be because everyone writing the literary criticism is a literary critic you know it's sort of like this um uh, it's it's a really good career move to say that your own career is super important now more than ever. You know, <laughs> it's like, um, uh, and then a completely different angle on the career question would be: I was wondering why Hayden White is situating himself. If this is actually a distancing thing, as Daniel suggested, which I think it could easily be read that way, why he's situating himself within a tradition of literary criticism instead of within a tradition of historiography. Mm -hmm. Unless that's simply because the two have simply become so infused with one another. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know as people fairly well read in the social sciences that literary criticism has, has worked its way into pretty much every other branch of the humanities, but he goes out of his way to only talk about literary critics. I mean, he talks about Foucault, but he doesn't really talk about him. The people he goes out of his way to quote from are literary critics. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering what either one of you might think about either of those two things. Mm -hmm. I'll just say briefly that uh, I didn't see it as uh, first, I, 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 saw, I didn't see it as an evaluation, negative evaluation or judgment on, uh, of deconstructionism. Uh, I, and I didn't see it, I didn't detect that this act of distancing. Um, and the reason why was in my mind be, was because he kind of showed the inevitability of absurdism. You know, this is the way things are going. And he almost made a case for a <laughs> historical determinism, a cu cultural determinism. Like if, if the, these are the things that happen in, as a literary theory progresses over time, absurdist moment will happen. Um, could be a matter of time sooner or later, but. Um, so he was like, I saw, I saw him himself as being involved in there and observing, and maybe the impact that he's going after is to, uh, to encourage critics and readers to not take the whole uh, business 
very seriously. <laughs> but yeah. no, no, that's totally fair. I, I mean, he starts off the essay saying kind of like literary criticism doesn't have any idea what it's doing right now, which creates mm-hmm. a sort of negative feeling. But I do agree that there's almost a feeling of this, this is there's a logical progression here. It's almost and maybe I'm wrong about it. it's almost like there's a feeling that if it stays here, there's a problem, or if it ends up eating itself, you know, then there's a problem. And there's almost maybe a feeling of a nudge of, hey, we got to we got to sort this out. We got to figure out what we're doing, because I basically just suggested that history is a literary genre. And I don't want all the historians coming over here and, you know, literary criticism, not having a clue what it's doing. It's not going to work out too well. Um, but I, I, I think that's fair where there's a descriptive element and say this is the state of things. It makes sense that there was a logic that would lead you here because maybe it was um, somewhat determined or probable that this would occur just by the nature of the foundations of Western thought, like he mm-hmm. was saying at the end with, with Plato. I think that's a very fair reading. Um, whether I, my impression of it was he was suggesting we need to move on or figure out some sort of relationship between um, a, a way, well, it, it gets back to this kind of idea where we have, we, uh, we learn how to interpret. We like we get we learn how to interpret where it doesn't become reductionist, but it also does not become platonic, where we do believe that there is a text and we're trying to figure out the different strings where we don't just read it in terms of Marxism, maybe, but also in terms of gender, also in terms of X, also in sociology, also in terms of narrative, where we learn um, where we learn how to do all those things as opposed to just simply isolating ourselves. And I think John's making a very good point. Perhaps. The problem is that careerism can bring with it an isolationism of becoming an expert in a certain kind of interpretation, as opposed to having a Swiss, uh, you know, it's a violent image, maybe a toolbox instead of a Swiss army knife, instead of like a toolbox of different modes of interpretation. We say, well, let's try a Marxist interpretation here. Oh, that's got, that brings out some interesting. Well, let's try a traditionalist interpret. Oh, that's interesting. Let's see it through the lens of religion. Oh, that's interesting. That's, that doesn't tend to be what occurs perhaps so much because of the fet- fetishization that then has each individual school isolating themselves into their particular method so Mm -hmm. you don't get a growing dialectic between those things um and then before passing it on i just wanted to know john that was really interesting on what you're saying about the internet before the internet you could believe that like somebody knew everything because now i'm thinking like before the printing press when say and then the only book in the town that mattered was the bible and there was like one person who had the bible then that person could really create the impression of knowing everything and being the only person that knew everything. Well, I mean, uh, 200 years ago is an exaggeration, but I mean, they, they would say of people, you know, in the 16th and, and maybe even the 17th century that, and, and when I say everything, I don't mean every single fact. I mean, sure. everything important. Right, right. You know, everything important, like you can quote Newton to you, yep. you can quote, you know, Aristotle or, or uh, Epicurus and, you know, whatever yeah. but if, if it, the important things right but then that, that's the actual definition or, or sort of what people were getting at when they talked about a renaissance a man renaissance someone man. who was someone who could basically um plumb the depths of nearly every field um very very thoroughly yeah and that's fascinating because that feeds into platonism like if you encounter people and it was possible to really believe that people knew what was important that in one person, everything could be concentrated that is important, that leads into an idealistic way of thinking or normative way of thinking, as opposed to now, when it's obvious that no one can know everything that's important, how that feeds a splinter view um, of where you have to have something maybe more like specialists or different things. But we've talked about some of the problems of specialists, but then some of the benefits of specialists. But it's just, and that's another conversation we've already had. But that's really interesting, John. I had not thought about how much easier it was to believe that someone actually knew everything relative to um, past information technologies. That, and, and that and past, that was, I mean, three, three or 400 years ago is not terribly long ago. No, I mean, no. time moves so, so, I mean, 300 years ago sounds like a long time ago, but it's, it's not. Um, I, I, I kind of wanted to add something on and to agree with Davud that, um, yeah, I guess if you, if you give, if, if say pre-1945, just to attach a year onto it, literary criticism was unified by the idea that we could use language to uh, cast normative um, pictures um, or, or give normative statements about literature. Um, and if we, can, if, we, if we use that assumption that, to unify all of literary criticism, because that's basically what most of literary criticism was before the war, then yeah, that will break down because I, I think it's almost impossible to have something like two 
gigantic worldwide world wars <laughs> and not have gigantic changes in basic assumptions about what language can do and how, um, you know, uh, in some sense, utterly powerless we are as people and, and the absurdism in other senses of the word that we also see in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, absurdist theater, for example. Yeah, yeah. Now, both the both the strength of language, that what it can do and what it cannot do. And uh, John, you you mentioned in the beginning uh, the, the the worshiping of silence, and this is a posture of the contemporary, at, at least Hayden White's time and maybe our time too. The he says the the more critics realize that they can't they can't do they can't accomplish much, the more they talk, and it's like their helplessness. Uh, is expressed with more and more and um, almost a compulsive behavior, but compulsive speech, even though what they say, the content of what they're talking about is like, oh, we cannot, uh, there's no point in criticism. Uh, there's no boundary between uh, life and literature and between literature and, and criticism, uh, but they keep talking about that. So I wonder what you, uh, what you both thought about that kind of, that gesture of helplessness and then speech and then like the suppression of silence. <laughs> Well, what you what you just said reminded me of one of the conversations that we had recently in another context, but I think it applies here. The more that you talk in in a sense of um, sometimes you talk and and the, the when, and we assume the meaning of talking is to convey information, but the the steady flow of ideas um, or just words is meant to actually conceal an absence instead of to uncover a presence. Mm -hmm. um, I, you said that when, and I mean, it, it sort of made me stop in my tracks and, and think about how true that is sometimes. Mm -hmm. that, that maybe, you know, an entire uh, branch of, um, of a pursuit like literary criticism can just be, you know, a bunch of sound and fury. While claiming that it is... <laughs> claiming that for itself, but still yeah. going on, going on. Yeah. And that, that, that could, we could relate that to your point about careerism too. You know, people need to publish to get their promotions and to, to claim that they are, they are, they are doing things and they're, they're working. Yeah. I, we could, you know, maybe wrap up slowly our discussion of this chapter and say a few things about the, the, the book, the collection of essays uh, in general as a whole. Uh, sure. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Okay. No, I, I was just going to add on what you were saying about silence. Um, yeah, John put it very well. I mean, there can be a way to talk to hide the fact that there's nothing to say or mm -hmm. that or to hide the fact that you are saying something that has already been said or that you are saying something that is not finished. A good dimension of Derrida that I think is valuable. Um, you know, it's funny because uh, Derrida, you know, someone once asked him in his house and like, have you read all these books? And he's like, oh, no, no, I haven't read many at all. But the ones I have read, I know really well. And it was really interesting, like Finnegan's Wake, he like did, a, I think he did his dissertation on, he read it really, really close. He didn't read many books, but the ones he read, he read really, really well. And that's kind of interesting because you have this idea of someone who's, you know, texts don't, you know, just kind of burning through them or whatever, but really he's reading them very well. And what's interesting is that the project of deconstruction in some respects, um, or some of the way that he put it forth. And of course, when you talk about deconstruction, you're not necessarily talking about Derrida's thought. You could be talking about like Paul de Mon and different things. But anyway, it was kind of this idea that he would go, okay, so you got this complicated philosophical system, but you'll notice that if you go to the notes in the back, the footnotes that no one's supposed to look at, there's this kind of footnote here that unveils they can't justify that axiom on page 480. And if they can't justify that axiom on 480, the whole system doesn't work. Hmm. And Derrida, from his close readings, would see how many systems would do that, how they would try to conceal these skips in logic or these, these parts that don't really aren't really addressed and sort of put them in the back. Uh, um, Kant does that in, in one of them where he, he's exploring the idea that if you could actually cross the noumenon or the world of the things of themselves, that there would be no possibility of a moral life. Well, that's really weird. So he puts that in a really short fragment, and I can't remember, in like one of the backs of his books, and in Zizek and the Organs Book about Body talks about that. But anyway, the, the point is, to, and then I'll close, is this idea that another thing, you can have the, the, the words that are presented in the text hiding the incompleteness or hiding the details that the, the, the thinker or the writer doesn't know in the back 
of the book. So you can also have words hiding other words that they're not as confident in because if you really examine that footnote, you go, well, hold on, that doesn't make sense. Or, you know, Derrida was suspicious of the fact that Heidegger didn't finish being in time and went off and wrote a bunch of essays. Like, well, wait a minute, hold on, wait, 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 come back. Why didn't you finish that? Because we need to get to the being of being now. Why, why have we stopped? You know, what does that unveil about the entire project? So another, you know, you're talking about words to hide silence, omission, can hide silent, you know, not mentioning, not getting around to, oh, I'm going to write that essay tomorrow that addresses that problem. They just happen to never get around. So there are all these interesting methods of um, avoiding, uh, of trying to avoid something or just concentrating on your one stream of literary thought and not seeing how it fits into a broader canvas can also be another way of avoiding the truths of if your project or what you're doing adds um, value and insight. <laughs> Uh, Daniel said, just made me think of uh, a little vignette about Umberto Eco. I think he had his house in Bologna or something where he, where he taught at the university. And someone walked into his house one day and he had a, a, a gigantic library, something like 30,000 books. And someone asked him a similar question. Uh, have you read all of these books? And he said, no, these are just the ones I have to finish by the end of the week. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, he himself or Nassim Nicholas Taleb uh, rem remembers this episode and says only people who don't read books, they ask questions like that. Because if you're really a reader, you know that you haven't read most of your books, you know? yes. most of the books in your personal library. You have them because you want to read them. That's <laughs> right. And yeah, yeah. Oh, and I love that because Nassim, Mr. Taleb talk, calls it the anti-library, which is to remind anti you, yeah. you know, most of us have libraries to feel like we know a lot when actually you need a library to remind you how little you know. Mm -hmm. You know, in some respects, it's better to have the books on your bookshelf you haven't read, so you can always go, I'm not as smart as I think, versus the ones that you have read that you can show off to your neighbors when they walk in. I always, I always love that, that, that lovely inversion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My neighbors never come in. <laughs> I, I <can't>. So <laughs> put them where you want. Just put them where you want. <laughs> <laughs> your cat loves you regardless. You don't have to prove yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so a, a few words. I, I didn't really prepare. Um, for, a, for an overall discussion and assessment of this book. but We pulled him into it, everyone. We pulled into it. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm glad. First, let me uh, add this note. I'm very grateful uh, to John for introducing uh, yes. me to Hayden White. Uh, this is really, it was a really nice surprise, very pleasant surprise. I, uh, you know, sometimes you have these ideas, not fully formed ideas, some inclining, inklings, uh, inclinations, and then uh, you meet an author that really has expressed all those uh, thoughts in, a, in their full form. So that was, um, I, I really appreciated those, uh, some, some of those early essays, especially they gave voice and expression to um, some of my own problems in the discipline of psychology and uh, what history does in psychology. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed this reading experience and discussing, the discussion was an added uh, benefit. Um, I see... To put it briefly, I see Hayden White's task to be very close to deconstruction. So he wants to deflate or blur, blur or like um, challenge the boundary between, for example, description and interpretation. So I, I really appreciate that facts and fiction. So he spent some of the early essays exploring those, uh, those dichotomies, those categories that what we consider to be a fact has a lot of interpretive elements already in it, has a lot of uh, tropic, metaphorical, linguistic flourishes that they, they are not added to it, they, are, they enable it, they enable the factual description. Uh, similarly, his uh, discussion of history and his, histori historicism, that uh, his, 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 historicism which claims history to be uh, lawful, you know, expressive of regularity, general laws and regularities that can be scientifically addressed. Um, he said that, well, that shouldn't be accepted, but we should at the same time keep in mind that history always kind of secretly, implicitly tries to be, tries to move towards historicism. So that infl inflationary uh, tendency exists not only in literary criticism, but also in, in history. And also, of course, he talks about his historical uh, works as literary artifacts, uh, blurring or challenging the boundary between history and literature. And then he has these uh, few, a couple of um, celebratory uh, essays, um, you know, talking about Foucault, talking about Vico, his heroes. And those were also really nice. Um, I enjoyed reading them to, to read more about the influences uh, behind his, his work, his scholarship. Yeah, that, that's, that's for me. Uh, what, what I liked most about all of the essays was that 
White seems to be walking a, a pretty f fine line between uh, pretty much respecting interdisciplinary boundaries while also blurring them. Um, you know, and I, I think reading him does, I mean, in the early essays, certainly the first four or five remind you how much history and the writing of history borrows from the idea of tropes and, and um, the, the, the theory of, of um, like genres, how you can implot things in different ways and use different sort of literary devices to tell a story. Um, and in that same way, it sort of clues you in into how other disciplines might be, or certainly are. Um, I know Davoud could stand up and give us a three hour lecture right now about the philosophical assumptions that are implicit in psychology. Um, there's tons of them. Um, <laughs> At least 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I, mean I, I know that, I mean, I haven't even <laughs> talked with you about that and I know it's something you thought about. Um, psychology is of course, you know, much, much newer as a formal discipline than literary criticism or historiography are, but <clears throat> it, it's interesting to think about how um, uh, branches of knowledge come into their own and how once they arise, they are still related in sort of, they, they leave their trace um, in how they came out from other branches, but then they also try to hide that trace. Uh, and what I think Hayden White does is he sort of redefines the lines around certain branches of knowledge, literary criticism, historiography, history, um, you know, intellectual history, and um, reminds you of those lines and those genealogies where it's appropriate. That was, that was beautiful. Um, you, again, Hayden White is one of those people who, again, I'm grateful for John and both of you because I didn't know about Hayden White. And it's another example of someone you go through life and your pursuit to be an educated uh, citizen of the world is, you know, the, the responsibility of being an active member. And you're like, oh, I didn't know about this person. Why didn't I know about this person? And it's just, um, there's something exciting about that whenever I encounter a new thinker or a book like that, because it's like, who else is out there that I don't know about who can add um, so much to your thinking and the ways that both of you have described. I think that's part of the excitement of reading. And it, and it is also, you know, although there's something disturbing about it no longer being possible to feel like you um, know everything, like they could say before the printing press, um, there's a flip side to that that's also really exciting because I don't know everything and what else could there be that could actually expand uh, your sense of the world in a, in a really great way. And so it's been exciting to, um, uh, to encounter Mr. White. Uh, I, I'll echo... Uh, what Mr. What Mr. What Davoud is is saying. One of the things I really appreciate um, about Mr. White is he's someone who is taking seriously uh, what we have learned from deconstruction without making it destructive per se. I if I if I am, I think the word deconstruction um, from Derrida is tied to Heidegger's notion of a clearing of making a clearing to build something new. Um, you know, you're tearing down, like you're moving aside in order to make a space for something else to grow. Unfortunately, I think Mr. White is correct that many people following deconstruction are actually more destructive where they tear down and there's not necessarily an idea of what to replace it with. Um, I think I think properly understood deconstruction is always supposed to be in service of reconstruction and reconstituting, but in such a manner that doesn't fall into the same mistakes as the past say by essentializing, like Foucault says, or by platonic forms that make everything else not even fully real or so on. So how do you carry out this reconstitution that is making something but also has learned? And White has shown some of the moves he thinks you need to engage to do that. You, one, need to understand that a lot of disciplines are trying to hide their trace, just like you described, John, or that, that history um, has a literary, um, it's, it's structured, it has a structure that is literary. And that by acknowledging that, then we actually have an idea of what we should fill the clearing with. And that is a taking interpretation seriously, paying attention to the, um, the genres that are in operation, the nature of the implotment, that that will help us um, really understand the text and, and build it anew in a manner that is solid. You know, deconstruction can make a clearing to build something that's solid, but not solid in a sort of oppressive, essentializing and shutting down the conversation, but solid like you can get a handle on it so that you can pass it around to other people to get their handle on it. You know, this kind of blend between interpretation and, you know, the, the hard take on things. So I appreciate Mr. White, you know, to, to as a beginning overview thought, um, 
uh, I really appreciate that he's actually feels like he, just like you're saying, Davut, he, he's taking seriously deconstruction, but in a reconstructive manner, making a clearing, taking seriously what we've learned and then saying, okay, well, what, well, what can we do about that? That is going to help us reconstruct something that is, um, that is new and good, but has taken seriously what we've learned. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I really think, and uh, I would encourage, one of the reasons why I would encourage other people to give this a try is that uh, White, through his writing, his, his style of writing and thinking, he encourages responsibility and responsible thinking, that we can never truly disown our descriptions. Disown, when I say disown, I mean something, a description that I've found, that I've given, an account that I've given, that is so true that I can just remove myself from it, that I can say it's no longer even my responsibility. It's that true. It is that factual. And uh, White says that we cannot, we cannot uh, claim a lack of responsibility because our trace of the, the, the trace of our activity, the acts of design and construction and in, and implotment is always there. So we um, that that remaining responsible and remaining attached uh, in, and engaged with the way we interpret and describe reality and history is is important. It's something that is a, a consequence of um, his his writing, which I also appreciate. All right. Anything else? Any final notes? It's been fun. It's been it fun. Been fun. And, and it I, has I, been fun. I, and, and we just started. Yeah, we did, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. so I, I just wanted on what you're saying with responsibility. I love the idea of we tend to think that if interpretation is involved, then it doesn't matter. But in fact, he's saying, no, no, no. If interpretation is involved, we're responsible. So we have to take it with more seriousness mm -hmm. and we have to think more about it. That interpretation equals responsibility. I think that is a really important idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much, both. Gentlemen, and, this has been a delight. And uh, till next year and uh, our next book. <laughs>